Hello, welcome to this talk on injunctions. In this series of talks, I'm going to be concentrating on the matters that go to the discretion of the court in granting an injunction. My name is Declan O'Dempsey, I'm a barrister at uh, Cloisters Chambers. In this first talk, I'm going to talk about the types of injunction and um, the equitable nature of the remedy and what that means. An injunction is an order of the court requiring the respondent to do something or stop doing something or to refrain from doing something in the future. There are various types. A mandatory injunction orders the respondent to do something specific, so for example specific performance of a contract obligation. A prohibitory injunction requires the respondent to refrain from doing something. And then there's an injunction that prevents a harm which has not yet happened, a future harm, but it's a harm which is feared by the applicant. And the order orders the respondent to do something or to avoid doing something. It's known by the Latin tag of queer timid, which means because he fears. It's important to remember that an injunction is a discretionary remedy and it's a particular type of discretion. It's an equitable remedy, so therefore judicial and moral discretion is highly relevant. So an injunction which is final is also known as a perpetual injunction. There are also interim injunctions which maintain the position uh, until trial of the action. Once it's granted, however, an injunction remains in force, no matter for how long, until it is discharged by the court. Have a look at the Isaacs and Robertson case of 1985, Appeal Cases 97. It also remains in force regardless of whether it should properly have been granted in the first place. Have a look at the 1994 case of M and the Home Office, one appeal cases uh, 377. One of the features of a, an injunction is that breach of it brings the sanctions of the court to bear. So the sanction for breach of an injunction is proceedings for contempt of court. And the consequence of that is that the order must be in such plain terms that they are clear enough to hang a loss of liberty on. Mandatory injunctions are less commonly obtained on an interim basis because the court will want full evidence before compelling a party positively to act in a certain way. So more often at an interim stage, um, a, a prohibitory injunction will be granted because the court's more likely to issue these without reference to fraud. Section 37 allows courts to grant injunctions, whether final or interim injunctions, in all cases in which it appears to the court to be just and convenient to do so. The order can be unconditional or it can be on terms and conditions as the court thinks fit. However, there has to be an underlying claim. It's a fundamental rule that the court will only grant an injunction at the suit of a private individual to support a legal right. Have a look at Montgomery and Montgomery, 1964, 2 WLR 1036. And it's important also to remember that uh, having a cause of action, being able to show a breach even, is a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition to obtain an injunction. Have a look at the South uh, Bucks uh, District Council and Porter, 2003, two appeal cases, 558. Another principle that needs to be borne in mind is that 
injunctions can be brought in by the court to render its other orders more effective. This concept of the power of the court to award where it is just and convenient to do so has limits and has had limits placed on it for a couple of centuries. First of all, there must be a right, that's normally a cause of action, and the limitations on the principle of just and convenient, it has to be both, can be found in the Siskina 1997 appeal cases 210. Typical um, situations in which a, an injunction will be granted uh, can be seen in the South Carolina Insurance Company and Asuranti Mashapage, uh, 1987, Appeal Cases 24. So the questions that one can ask are, can the applicant show that the respondent has invaded or threatens to invade the applicant's legal right or equitable right, uh, which the court is in a position to enforce, or has the respondent behaved or threatened to behave in a way which is unconscionable? Now, in later cases, this was said not to constitute a test as such, because it would be wrong to fetter the factors to which the Court of Equity can have regard. There are, however, potential uses for injunctions, particularly interim injunctions. Protecting human rights and issues such as confidentiality of information, enforcing restrictive covenants or other contract rights, protecting trade secrets, preventing the dissipation of assets by a respondent to an employment claim, to enforce fiduciary duties or restrain breach of them, to restrain certain acts of discrimination uh, under the Equality Act 2010. And then finally, they can be a useful adjunct in judicial review cases, for example, in a public sector equality duty case. The law of equity has been reduced to certain maxims, but these are all ways in which the court talks about the exercise of its discretion. One which we'll have a look at in more detail is the first of these, that the person who goes to equity, so who goes to the equitable court, court of equity, asking for a remedy, must come with clean hands. Now, we'll look at that in more detail later on. Secondly, equity will not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. Thirdly, equitable remedies bind the individual's conscience and act in the Latin phrase, in persona. That means that the equitable remedies of a court can have a greater reach than those which are based purely on common law. And then finally, there's something that should be a maxim, but I don't think has made it to that exalted status, um, and that's not to delay. Don't delay. You can lose the court's discretion by delay or latches, as it's called, uh, or by acquiescence in the breach of your right. So let's have a look at the concept of clean hands. Another way of putting it is that who seeks equity must do equity. However, you can't rely on general moral depravity of the uh, applicant. The grime, as it were, uh, must be sufficiently connected with the injunction. As it was put in the Grobelar case, the grime on the hands must of course be sufficiently connected with the equitable remedy that is sought. And whether or not there is, sorry, and whether there is or is not a sufficiently close connection must depend on the facts of the case, of each case. So typically, the misconduct which you would point to to show that the injunction shouldn't be granted 
will be conduct which is immoral, deliberate, material and inherently connected to the uh, injunction. Have a look at the Fiona Trust case. So it will come cover a number of types of behaviour. Conduct must be in connection with the presentation of the case. Have a look at the Armstrong case, 1959, 2QB384. The doctrine applies not only in a situation where the conduct is intended to build up a false case. It also applies if the false evidence is aimed at bolstering the truth. Have a look at the Gonthier case. And it also applies even if the conduct is detected before trial and not pursued. Have a look at the Willis and Sons Limited and Willis case 1986 one the state's Gazette Law Reports at 62. The point about conduct in this context is that it will be considered cumulatively. Taken individually, behaviour may be regarded as too trivial, but when it's taken together, the conduct may amount to inequitable conduct. It's worth noting that the threshold that the conduct must cross is a high one, so that not all unreasonable behaviour will cross that threshold. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the doctrine of clean hands and the disclosure regime under the new CPR rules 2013. Have a look in particular at the remarks made at the end of the RBS, PLC and Highland F uh, Financial Partners LP oh. and others case in the Court of Appeal in 2013, that's uh, EWCA uh, 328. What's necessary is that the conduct must have an immediate and necessary relation to the equity sued for. So first of all you have to identify the equity, in this case the injunction, and secondly the misconduct uh, with precision. Now in that case one of the applicants witnesses lied at the hearing of the application. This was a strong reason to refuse an anti-suit injunction. But at the end of the case the Court of Appeal made remarks concerning uh, the issues that are going to arise from the new disclosure regime. There are risks of material non-disclosure in interim injunction applications and because disclosure can now be limited to particular issues there may be a temptation as happened in the RBS case for a party to think that because an issue has not yet been reached, for example quantum, the disclosures that are relevant to the issues, for example, of liability, are the only material ones. That isn't the case and one must be very circumspect about uh, the effect of issue by issue disclosure. Lord Justice Maurice Kay, at paragraph 183 of the RBS case, uh, said that the issue in the case had arisen because of a deliberate decision not to address any quantum-related uh, issues uh, in relation to the application for the injunction, because they might muddy the waters um, on liability issues. He then referred to the new civil procedure rules, Rule 31.5.7c, which allows for disclosure on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. And he said that this must not create a framework for injustice in which one party's perception and appraisal of the case uh, is uh, handicapped by his being kept in ignorance 
of important material on the grounds that it is only relevant to issue B, but disclosure uh, is only necessary in relation to issue A. And it is that approach that he suggests one must be circumspect about.